Hey everyone, welcome to our ninth FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So first I'd like to thank all of you for watching this, whether it's live today or if you're watching the recording. And remember, you can always go to our website to find out the upcoming talks and access the recorded talks too. And we'll post the URL in the chat window. You can find, um, so you can find all the upcoming talks there. And um, and today, if you have a question during the talk, then I'll post it in this um, the streaming channel that you see. And um, and if it's a question, please proceed it with a queue. So today, our presentation is an intro an introduction to Cherry by Dr. Robert N. M. Watson. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Robert. Uh, Robert is a professor in system security and architecture at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory. He's involved in several research groups at the lab, including security, networks and operating systems, and computer architecture. He leads a number of cross-layer research projects spanning computer architecture, compilers, program analysis, program transformation, operating systems, networking, and security. He has strong interest in open source software, is on the board of directors of the foundation, and has contributed extensively to the FreeBSD project. Lastly, he is a co-author on the design and implementation of the FreeBSD operating system second edition, published by Pearson. In here, I'm gonna show you the book, and I highly recommend, hopefully you can see this, and I highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about the internals of the operating system to get this book. And now I'll hand it off to Robert. Thanks, Deb. Uh, thank you for that introduction. This is a talk that is about a research technology, Cherry, which we spent the last decade creating, uh, supported by some very generous sponsors, including DARPA in the US. Um, in part, this is a talk about architecture, and in part, this is a talk about operating systems, because I think something important to know about Cherry is that we could never have done this project without FreeBSD. Uh, it is motivated by the problems that exist in FreeBSD, the issues we encounter running operating systems like FreeBSD. FreeBSD uses technologies that are really essential to the work we've done. FreeBSD was an early adopter in LLVM, uh, provides features like Dtrace and Capsicum and countless other things that really made FreeBSD a great OS to use for this research. So I don't want to to run into the talk without first mentioning how important FreeBSD is to this work. And if you look at the research team, we have a team of about 30 people, by the way, um, you know, a good uh, dozen of them are now FreeBSD committers. Maybe they didn't start out that way uh, when they joined the project, but they definitely are now. Uh, and many others, you know, we hired them and bring them on because they're FreeBSD developers. So it's really, uh, it's a project we've done very closely in collaboration with the community. So uh, I will tell you about uh, our work on Cherry. Let me share my window here. With any luck, everyone can see my slides. Uh, so the first thing to notice um, in a talk about Cherry is our extensive co-author list. Um, it is a 10-year-old project. I said currently a team of around 30. A lot of people have worked on it. Uh, we're not quite up there with particle physicists in terms of having co-author lists, but we are trying. In fact, we recently overflowed a buffer uh, in the IEEE uh, conference and publication management system because our author list on our papers got too long. You will see why that's a funny joke later, hopefully. All right, so let's tell you a bit about Cherry. Uh, so what will I do? I'm going to tell you a bit about the Cherry architecture. I'm going to tell you about uh, the Cherry research and transition. This is a really exciting moment for Cherry transition because we've had a long running and until pretty recently not widely publicized collaboration with ARM to try and figure out whether these ideas make uh, a lot of sense in a proprietary, you know, professionally developed, high quality commercial implementation of a processor to which we answer we think now is yes. Um, so I'll tell you about that and about a forthcoming chip that ARM is producing that incorporates all the things that we're going to talk about here and also runs all the software we're going to talk about. If you want to learn more about Cherry, uh, take a look at our website, cherry-cpu.org. Uh, you will find um, you know, a nice, complicated, text-rich uh, website of the sort that FreeBC developers and academics have come to know and love. If you want to learn more about Cherry, I want to read a document on it. We have this uh, short-ish introduction to Cherry at 40 pages. Uh, we then have some copiously longer documents. If you find the 40-page document super exciting, we have the you know 500-plus page uh, specification of the architecture. We have a new version coming out. 
I think probably next week uh, at this point, we're currently wishing a release approval for that, talks about our work on ARM. We also have uh, what we call the Cherry C and C++ programming guide. When you uh, program software for Cherry, you program in C and C++ or whatever other languages you want to. Uh, but there are some subtle but important differences in how that works out that gives us some of our safety properties. Uh, and so we have a, a programming guide specifically on that. That in some senses may be uh, the best thing to look at if you want to learn about our memory protection work. Um, but I'll, I'll point you with some other documents to go along. So the first thing I need to tell you is about something called a capability system, because that is what Cherry is. Cherry takes uh, ideas from research capability systems of the past and kind of atom smashes them with uh, contemporary processor design, contemporary compiler design, contemporary operating system design. Um, the novelty in Cherry is not that we've done a capability system, because lots of people have done capability systems. Uh, the novelty we think is that we've done a capability system that you can deploy and use with much of your current software in the real world, in mobile devices and servers at a scale that was never possible before without clean slate designs. Um, and that really is exciting, because you can do some neat things with capability systems. So what is a capability system? A capability system is a design pattern. Uh, many things can have capability systems imposed on their designs. It can be processes and programming languages and operating systems. I've done some of, of all of these in my research. But what is it that it does? A capability is a, is a handle, if you will. It's a reference to something. It is a communicable, unforgeable token of authority. If you hold the capability, you can access the object. If you are a Unix system programmer, you will recognize this because if you have a file descriptor, you can access the file. Uh, that is the handle that you have. You can't just make them up. You have to open the file first. You can pass them around and so on. Um, great. A capability-based system, then, is a system in which resources are only reachable via capabilities. So Unix incorporates ideas about capabilities, you know, inherits them from lots of prior designs. Um, but it isn't generally a capability-based system because there are lots of other ways to get to files. You can get them by opening them, for example, using absolute pods. And you might remember or know that in our prior work on Capsicum, uh, we figured out that actually you could blend ideas about capability systems with conventional designs in a way that's incrementally deployable. So you don't have to be completely capability-ish if you don't want to too soon. Um, and actually, that's really important because those ideas about how we merge capability systems with real world systems are what gives us Cherry. It's what we do in the architecture instead of the operating system. So you can think of it as being a bit like Capsicum, although of course, completely different. So why is capability system useful? Um, we use capabilities and capability systems to limit the scope of damage. When something goes wrong from accidental behavior, intentional behavior, if we will, in software, we basically want to limit what can be done. We want to reason about those limits. Um, and the goal of a capability system is to make this natural and efficient. So there are lots of ways to limit the privilege of software. Some of them are extraordinarily painful and detailed, but a capability system is a very natural way to do it. And in Cherry, we really have two goals. Uh, we want to allow you to implement what's called the principle of least privilege. This is a very old idea in computer security. It's the idea that when you run software, it runs with as little privilege as possible. Because if it has too much privilege, then that is something the attacker can use that they don't need to have access to. So we want to, to minimize privilege. Uh, the other thing is like a, a not very well documented principle that really, I think, you know, the idea is there in earlier systems, but it's never really clearly expressed. And this is what we call the um, principle of intentional use. This says that when software holds multiple privileges, which typically it must do to do anything interesting, um, it has to pick which to use explicitly. It can't be looked up implicitly in the design because then you might use the wrong privilege. And a lot of the attacks we care about are about privileges you hold anyway, but that I, as the attacker, want you to use the wrong one in a way that you don't intend. Sometimes these are called confused deputy attacks. When in Cherry and other capability systems like Cherry, the principle of intentional use is really is really essential to the design. So what is Cherry? Uh, Cherry is a roughly $30 million research project started in 2010 between SRI International, the University of Cambridge, and actually more recently, also ARM. Um, and in fact, I say 30 million, that is the research cycle that got us to where we are over the course of a decade. Um, I think ARM has now spent something approaching that uh, in terms of their investment in transition. Uh, and in September of last year, uh, we announced a $225 million program uh, to take Cherry from these early prototypes we do in the more academic environment and turn them into a real world system on chip and process designs and software designs and so on in a collaboration between the UK government, um, the University of Cambridge, uh, University of Edinburgh, and also Lenara. So uh, a very exciting uh, and now much, much larger project. So Cherry is an architectural protection model. What does it mean? When I use the word architecture in this talk, uh, I mean the instruction set architecture. I mean the interface between hardware and software. And so what we're doing in Cherry is we're taking those abstract ideas about a capability system and we're putting them in the instruction set between hardware and software. So we add new security primitives to the instruction set. And then we implement those in the hardware. So the microarchitecture implements these things. And then this enables us to do new things in software. So that's the goal of the exercise. We want to make software better somehow. And sometimes you do change the hardware to do that in the instruction set. You add vectors or you add GPUs or whatever you might add, things involving keys, et cetera. Well, we're adding capabilities. Um, and what we want to do is enable a bunch of protective behaviors. Um, 
Cherry uh, mitigates vulnerabilities. So the goal is to say that you know software has vulnerabilities. We want to make the vulnerabilities go away by design, but often we have trouble doing that because with these large trusted computing bases written in C and C++, they just aren't going away. Hypervisors and operating systems and language runtimes and web browsers, we accept that those have vulnerabilities, so we want to mitigate them. And we do this in two ways using Cherry. The first is something called fine-grained memory protection. Um, We'll talk about it in detail. Uh, basically, makes your C a bit more like a language like Rust or Python, memory safe. Uh, and then we have something called scalable compartmentalization. This is about something beyond the process model. It's about having smaller and smaller compartments of software, each of which has as little privilege as possible. So when someone tries to break out of one of them, they don't get nearly as much. Um, and the goal is also to break common exploit techniques. And actually, we have some really nice demonstrations of this. So when we look at the 2019 pile of iOS exploit chains released by Google Project Zero uh, on their blog, you know, last year sometime, uh, we mitigated 100% of the zero day uh, exploit chains made available for iOS, uh, which is a really nice thing to be able to say. Uh, another major world vendor of software is going to release um, a red team the exercise report on Cherry, I think next week. Um, and hopefully what they'll say when they release that report is, is what we think they're gonna say, which is that probably we, we close somewhere between like 60% and 100% of the vulnerabilities they've had to patch uh, in the last five years. And that is a really exciting thing to be able to say because that is transformative in how we deal with software security. So another exciting thing about capability systems is that they can actually mitigate vulnerabilities, not as vulnerabilities you don't know about, but classes of vulnerabilities we haven't yet discovered and classes of exploit techniques that aren't known today. Not all of them but some of them, and even some of them is a good start. So let's talk about how we got to Cherry. So Cherry was done using a technique called hardware software co-design. It's actually slightly more complicated. Cherry was done using a technique known as hardware software semantics co-design. So in hardware software co-design, you change the architecture between hardware and software, and then you trickle the changes up and down the stack into the compiler and the operating system, into the microarchitecture, and you do this iteratively as you evaluate and decide, you know, is that the right change so we need to change it somehow? Um, I've told you Cherry is an architectural technique. It, it runs, uh, you know, it's in the instructions that it affects C and C++ language software. We're not uninterested in other languages. We think they're great ideas. We're just system programmers. We'd like to program in C and C++, and also that's where the problems lie. We add some tagged memory. We add some new hardware capability data types. We'll tell you about those. Um, a key thing about Cherry is how it hybridizes with current designs. First of all, it does, which is great. Uh, it works with your existing RISC ISAs, and actually we think also non-RISC ISAs, but particularly RISC ISAs. The CPU designs, the superscalar cores, the operating systems that have virtual machines and processes, C and C++ language stuff. That is a, a real innovation here. Um, but also, when you deploy the hardware, you don't have to change everything at once. We deploy incrementally in the same way we might deploy 64-bit. You know, not everything is 64-bit immediately. You know, some things run as 32-bit, but you know, we can compile things to get access to these new features. And that incrementalism is also important for new hardware. So in this code design, what do we did? What do we do? We have an abstract protection model. A bit like virtual memory, right? It, you know, it's done differently, different hardware and different software, but we kind of all have this mutual understanding. It's a portable model. We then have instantiations in several different instructions and architectures. So we started off using 64-bit MIPS. We now have uh, 32 and 64-bit RISC-5 and 64-bit RMV8A, uh, probably equally mature, I think. Uh, they run our complete software stack. Everything I describe in this talk works on all of these things. We have formal models, we prove things. We have emulators like QMU. Uh, we do FPGA prototyping. We have, uh, I think, you know, three actively used FPGA cores right now, a uh, super scalar core, five stage pipeline, a three stage pipeline for Cherry Risk Five. So quite a scope of micro octet variety. We do this because we want to demonstrate generality. These ideas apply to small CPUs and to big CPUs. Um, we do formal proofs, as I said, uh, we prove things uh, that the architecture, if implemented correctly, provides certain security properties. One of the novelties of Cherry is this is the first time anyone has ever done that uh, in for a security architecture in, in an instruction set. This is a novel thing to do. Uh, we have a complete open source software stack available on GitHub. Might not surprise you to learn that it's based on Clang and LLVM, LLD, uh, FreeBSD, and then the open source uh, software suite. And this was, as I said at the beginning, is really important to us. Um, and then what is co-design? It means you iterate. You do it over and over again. You fix the hardware, you fix the software, you discover it's not compatible enough, or maybe the security isn't good enough. And that takes years, uh, to date, 10 years. Just 10 years. You know, the first few years, we really spent building the research platform. It took a year to get to the point where we had a CPU mature enough to do the research uh, as open source, because 10 years ago, open source CPUs weren't a particularly popular and widely used thing. Uh, we did a lot of low-level prototype architecture. We learned how to like blend these ideas about capabilities uh, and virtual memory and operating systems together. We then spent several years working on how C works, how operating systems are designed. You know, this is where FreeBSD and LLVM come into the story. Uh, we then spent a few more years working on efficiency and semantics and you know strong memory protection compatibility and we began a long-running collaboration with arm 
In the last two years, we've broadened out to the open source RISC-V ISA, uh, worked on new forms of memory protection, uh, worked more in formalism. But on the right-hand side of this picture, in a font too small for you to read, uh, in 2020 and 2021, something exciting is happening. So from 2014, we have been working very closely with ARM in an unpublicized uh, project to adapt the ARM V8A architecture, which is what is used in your mobile phone and your tablet and maybe uh, in your servers in Azure and AWS and so on, um, to try and figure out how to bring these ideas together with ARM's products. Um, so last week, uh, their first instruction set specification using Cherry was published. Um, and uh, in about two or three weeks' time, they'll release software emulators, software platforms, and so on. And in one year's time, uh, the first board will ship. Uh, which is a really neat thing to have to say. It is an experimental board. You will not be able to buy a million of them and put them in products. But there will be you know, hundreds or thousands of them made, which can be used by people who want to learn about this and then design a next generation of products based on the ideas. So uh, let's talk about Cherry. So uh, what do we want to do in Cherry? Well, the first thing you have to do is observe a gap. You know, why, is, why is something needed? Uh, today, memory management units implement uh, virtual memory. This is the most commonly used protection model in processes today. Uh, there are other kinds of protections. There are sort of various vulnerability mitigations around stacks and control flow, and uh, there are enclave, you know, all this stuff. But MMU is really what we think of when we think about OS design. It's the thing that gives us processes. It's the thing that gives us virtual machines. In a memory management unit, uh, data is protected by its location in the address space. You generate an integer pointer uh, out of some arithmetic. And then based on what you get, you can access some data, and then you have some rights to that data. Uh, page table entries control your permissions. Um, Cherry complements that, where the MMU protects the things that are pointed to by addresses. We protect the addresses themselves. We protect the pointers, the references to the data. And that allows us to do some really interesting things. Um, in protection systems of this sort, you somehow, when you're at performing an access to control it, you have to find the metadata that describes what's allowed. And what we do is we bind that metadata to the existing pointer. So we avoid adding more tables and more indirection. That is an important microarchitectural choice because adding new lookup tables creates enormous cost in the microarchitecture and a royal pain for the software side as well. You have to keep all these tables in sync and so on. Um, it prevents energy efficiency and scalability. So the MMU depends on them. We accept that. We don't replace the MMU. We complement it. We then have to find policies somewhere. And we find them in two places. We find them in the programming language in much the same way that languages like Java and so on find protection properties in the languages. Um, you know, we look to the C and C++ compilers, the linker, the operating system, the runtime, and so on. And then sometimes we do something new. You know, we want a new software abstraction, and we can't look to existing abstractions. So if we want to break processes up into tons of tiny sandboxes, we don't want to use processes because they come with some of these inherent rates. The, the abstraction is intrinsically tied to mechanism. Um, so we need new abstractions to allow us to describe what the architecture now lets us do. So what is a capability? Um, it is at heart, uh, if you will, then a virtual address, a pointer um, that we have added some new stuff to. Uh, we have a tag. Uh, this is invisibly carried around by the architecture. It tells us, you know, is this a valid pointer, basically? I'm going to use the word pointer all over the place. You can actually use capabilities for other things than pointers. But let us, you know, uh, elide over that for a moment and just stick to pointers. Uh, the values, the addresses, the memory locations that get carried around. You try to use a pointer that doesn't have a valid tag, an exception, a trap is thrown. Um, if you overwrite a pointer partly in memory, the tag goes away because it wasn't a valid transformation. We have some bounds. Uh, these will be familiar to people who work in the bounds checking systems or type safe languages or whatever. You know, sorry, you can't access outside of them. We use some what we think are very clever techniques to make, make basically a 256-bit pointer fit into 128 bits. Some people will be nervous about the size of that, and we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And then we have to support some very obscure C behaviors, such as pointers that go out of bounds and come back in again. And, you know, software doesn't work if you don't do this. We carry around some permissions. Then we carry around some additional properties that are really about this sandboxing, this isolation stuff, which we'll talk about as well. What does it look like in the architecture? Uh, in RISC-V uh, and in Morello, which is this ARM CPU, basically we've taken your 64-bit registers and we've made them 129 bits. It sounds microarchitecturally awkward, but it, it actually works really well. In some prior work, we've tried other things. We've tried putting them in their own registers, like floating point. Um, much better idea to extend our baseline registers. It minimizes microarchitectural costs. It avoids more serious disruption of the ADI. Lots of good hardware and software reasons. So we extend all this stuff. Um, the general purpose registers, basically anywhere you could hold an integer or a pointer before, you can now hold one of these wider things. Uh, we also extend some other important bits of the architecture, like the program counter. And we provide some compatibility features to allow historic applications you know, future historic applications that use integer addresses to still work. Um, so that's kind of like the high level view. Um, how has the story evolved? As I said, you know, we've worked on this for a decade. A lot of stuff has been going on. It's really been about uh, fine grained memory protection for C and C++. Um, and then it both a spatial safety and temporal safety uh, about compartmentalization 
and about architectural portability. Uh, we're interested in making these ideas apply in a portable way. So when we talk about virtual memory, we're excited because when we run Unix, FreeBSD, Linux, whatever, Mac OS X, on any of these a number of architectures, x86 and ARM and so on, they basically behave the same, right? You know, yes, all the details are different and power and instruction generation and so on, but you know, there are aspects of these models that are portable, and we need Cherry to be portable because it's in multiple architectures. So a lot of work going on uh, over an extended period of time, but I think increasingly work we consider mature, mature enough to go build a chip, basically. Future release, we have a new version of the ISA coming out, uh, hopefully in the next week, that extends the existing version. Version seven was roughly speaking uh, what most of ARM's work has been uh, centralized on over the last year or two. Um, version eight, it's basically, a, I mean, largely incremental changes. A bunch of stuff we thought was crazy turned out not to be crazy. This is great. Uh, we worked hard on temporal state, memory safety. This is um, use after free, if you will. Um, a bunch of work on sort of control flow robustness, some minor improvements to C compatibility. Uh, the biggest change actually is making RISC-V support very mature uh, and also uh, synchronizing ourselves uh, to Morello. So the Morello ISA is basically Cherry ISA V8 cast into ARM V8A. Uh, not a hardware talk, but let me just glance at a CPU design. This is a very simple three-stage microcontroller. Um, we extend some registers. Uh, we add some new instructions. Uh, we change the memory subsystem to carry around these tags. We have to store the tag somewhere. Uh, we partition DRAM uh, to store them in a specific place. So uh, we can kind of hide it. We don't have to change physical memory. Uh, so thinking about what we do with it, um, so Cherry protects pointers. Um, so we're going to provide some new protection properties. Some of these, you know, looking back at the thing about registers seem very straightforward. We added some bounds to registers. We can now use the bounds for pointers. We adjust the bounds uh, on pointers to reflect the memory allocator's beliefs about the space that's available to them, the stack allocator, the heap allocator. But we actually also introduced some rather more subtle properties. So we have something called provenance validity. Provenance validity says, you know, pointers are derived from other valid pointers. They are only valid themselves um, if the transformation to get to them was valid. Um, so, you know, if you do something that's not permitted to the pointer, you overwrite part of it, or you try to adjust the bounds in the wrong way, it's no longer a usable dereferenceable pointer uh, in the architecture. Once you have that set of protection properties, you then ask a bunch of questions, and this is the research cycle. It's like, you know, does software still work when I've done this? What do I have to change about software? You know, are they just small changes or are they big changes? Um, you know, on the compartmentalization side, can I use it to do the things that I claim? And this is where FreeBSD came into the story, uh, because what we were interested in as you elaborate all this out is, you know, um, does it play out in real world software at scale? Um, when we look at memory safety, uh, this is one of the main things we've done with FreeBSD in the last few years is to make it memory safe. We have a version of FreeBSD in which, you know, on the whole, we can strongly estate, you know, lots of subtleties and qualifications. We're academics and we care about details because we're security people. You know, on the whole, there are no exploitable buffer overflows. You can't inject pointers over the network. You know, uh, when memory is freed, um, you know, uh, we aren't able to use uh, alias pointers to confuse types to generate use after free attacks and things like that. Um, so what we've done there is we've taken the C and C++ programming languages and we've protected both all the pointers you can see, you know, uh, the ones you put on your heap and your stack and you point to these various things, but also the entire language runtime underneath is protected using the same primitives. So for those of you who do runtime linkers and elf linkage, um, pointers into variable argument arrays have bounds on them. Uh, you know, all the underlying parts of function pointers have integrity and provenance validity associated with them. Uh, your global variables are protected and have bounds on them, all kinds of from a research perspective, but maybe much more detail than we want to talk about today. So we don't protect against at either of these levels. Um, a lot of the protections in the bottom half are a bit subtle. Uh, they're used to mitigate gaps in protection in the top half in some sense. If you can break spatial safety or temporal safety, or you know, there's aspects of C design that make temporal safety or uh, spatial safety basically impossible because C is just one of those languages, then we have to fall back on these lower level protections, which are themselves an expression of least privilege of the way your software is constructed. Hmm. Maybe too subtle a point uh, for this venue, but I'm happy to take questions on it. Uh, so what does it look like? Well, you know, your process today is this big web of explicit and implied pointers that are basically how your program accesses all of its data, even its global variables, right? And variables on the stack are all reached implicitly via pointers. And what we've done is we've gone through that whole design and we've said, let's just make them capabilities. And that itself is not sufficient. That gives you these integrity properties, which are very nice, um, but you have to reduce the bounds on them. You have to make sure that monotonicity works with real software. And we have a paper talking about this in painful detail. Uh, this is uh, work led by Brooks Davis, uh, well-known FreeBSD developer, uh, published at ASLOS last year. We were very pleased to get a best paper award for it. It basically says you can make user space in Unix memory safe. Um, we meant spatially memory safe. So we have another thread of research around temporal memory safety, a uh, paper by uh, my colleague, uh, Wes Wado, who's now at Microsoft Research, uh, explaining how to make 
uh, that same environment temporally memory safe with respect to heaps. Um, this I think we consider slightly more experimental work. The Cherry ABI work, previous slide, you know, really very stable. We've been using it for years now. We've been running red team exercises with Duffer and others um, over the last year, especially. Um, the temporal memory safety, I think it works really well, uh, but we still feel like the performance is not quite there. So it's one of the big experiments in Morello is trying to make the performance be there. Uh, I mentioned this compartmentalization stuff. So uh, a neat property of these capabilities is you can't inject them into the system. They have to be derived from other capabilities. And when we say pointers are capabilities, what we mean is you, know, you can't just make up pointers. Well, what that means is that if you are granted a certain set of capabilities in your register file and via the memory that you can reach, you have access to only those things. So you have this sort of um, this graph of capabilities, just in the same way you'd have a graph of pointers to reach reachable objects. Only unlike with a graph of pointers, where you could kind of make up numbers, with capabilities, you can't do that. So what we can do is create these protection domains in the same address space where different parties can't access each other's data. And then we can provide very fast switching between them. Um, this work, I think, is, is less mature research. We have lots of great ideas. We have prototypes. We have all kinds of things. The claim we make is that when we use this model for software compartmentalization, we achieve orders of magnitude performance improvements over using processes for the same design. And we have some nice benchmarks and application case studies that show this off. What we're going to be working on over the next year on the path to Morello hardware is large scale case studies that work at the same scale that we've been doing our memory protection work at. Um, so we can happy to take questions on these, but maybe I'll just show you a couple of ideas about how much work work. Um, Cherry is an architectural primitive, um, like a memory management unit, uh, page tables. You can use it in lots of different ways. Uh, and so one of the key questions in this research is, you know, what way should we use these features to get the benefits that we want? Um, and we've come up with two things so far. I'm sure there will be more. Um, one of these is what we call isolated libraries. So you're running inside a process and you have a crypto library or you have an image processing library. And, you know, yeah, it's not written by your adversary, but it might as well have been because it's written in C and it does crazy buffer handling and it comes from the 1990s those things. We would like to go to sandbox those so that maybe the process crashes, but we guarantee it can't access anything that is outside of the library. We have another model we call Unix coprocesses. In Unix coprocesses, um, what we're saying is that uh, we can co-locate many processes safely in the same virtual address space. And we keep them isolated from each other using Cherry rather than using the memory management unit. So initially, that makes no difference at all to performance or anything else because they're using different pages and it's all fine. The interesting thing that happens is when we allow them to share pointers between each other because now they can access the same pages in each other's processes. Um, for those of you who do microarchitecture, using the same TLB entries, the same page table entries, and so on. Those uh, alias TLB entries and page table entries were one of the massive costs of doing shared memory IPC, which is one of the things that makes lots of processes and sandboxes really expensive in current architecture. So we have a model that allows us to do this. This was developed by Edward Napierella, um, who is also a FreeBSD developer and has done work with the FreeBSD Foundation. So lots of collaboration going on here. Um, both of these, by the way, will be available uh, on our Morello chip uh, from November 2021. So um, maybe just a few more words about software compartmentalization. I'll just show you a couple of pictures. I'll just slide forward through these slides. Um, library concepts. So when I describe it to you, what I say is, oh, we have some existing libraries like libc or libping or PDF library and so on. Normally, we run those in the same address space, and uh, they all have access to each other's data. What the attacker does is they compromise some component of it. They buffer overflow over a function pointer or return address, and then they replace that. And now they effectively have access to the entire address space. Um, in the world of Cherry, we're able to limit those accesses by saying, when we link libraries and provide them with memory and so on, they just don't get access to the remainder of it. The, the interesting challenge in Cherry is actually how you gain access to the things that you didn't have access to. Because you, know, you enter the library, you give up all these capabilities, it all looks great. And then you want to jump back out again and how did you get back to them? Because we also told you, you can't just make stuff up. So we actually have some uh, interesting architectural primitives and microarchitectural primitives that allow us under very controlled circumstances to gain privilege back again. Um, so what we do is we're jumping back and forward, essentially via a little microkernel uh, that exists in user space uh, that has the privilege to access the entire process and a bunch of sandboxes that have access to only little bits of process. Every now and then, uh, we have to go access things in other processes, you know, send messages to the Windows server. There we take these full context switches. In the Cherry model, the context switches on the left-hand side in this picture, the robust libraries, they don't enter the kernel. They don't take architectural traps. They're really just jumping in slightly special ways between various compartments. When we switch over to the right-hand side, you know, the feature is this is compatibility, by the way. We can use the old trap-based mechanism to switch between user processes, but traps are enormously disruptive to performance, and changing address spaces is enormously disruptive to performance. So it's really neat that we can do this. 
Um, the other model to show it to you again, this is the co-process model. Um, what we've done is we've then co-located all these processes inside the same address space. And again, we have a little user space domain switcher, a little library which has the ability to switch between things that is effectively part of the kernel. It's actually uh, mapped into the process memory in the same way there's a thing called VDSO, which is this uh, shared library injected into every process in, in most contemporary Unix designs and available. Uh, it's actually really part of the kernel. It just happens to run in user space. Um, this is the same thing. We have a little bit of magic user space that is effectively used by the kernel to allow uh, process context switching back and forth. And we actually, um, the technique developed by Edward here is, is really rather clever. It's actually a lazy context switch. So what happens is you switch back and forth between process and eventually, you know, uh, the kernel can't see the processes are switching back and forth between each other because it's not involved at all. Eventually, your second process does a system call or takes a trap, and the kernel has to catch up lazily with the state that's in user space. Uh, it's a really, it's a really quite neat approach. Uh, so the transition story, uh, since I keep mentioning ARM to you. So uh, we have been pursuing basically two DARPA supported adaptations of Cherry into contemporary architectures. So one of them is this experiment, if you will, with ARM, looking at applying it to ARM V8A. Uh, ARM V8A, as I said, is the, it runs your iOS phone, it runs your Android phone, it's the 64-bit architecture we find essentially in every mobile device in the world. So uh, in 2019, ARM announced Morello. Uh, Morello is a multi-core system on chip, it's a development board, it's all these things tied together, it's the architecture combining things. Um, when I say it's experimental, I mean, in the way ARM would describe it to you, uh, I'll describe it to you too, is basically this is a one-shot, um, a very expensive one-shot, since we're talking about a $225 million investment across industry and government. Um, tended to demonstrate that these ideas are viable at an enormous scale. So in our in our lab, uh, we work with uh, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, which basically allow us to simulate chips, but they're much smaller than the processes that you find uh, in high-end designs. Also, they're academic designs, so they're completely fine, but you know they don't have the performance optimizations and focus on performance and energy use that the commercial designs do. Um, so this is an experiment at a commercial level of quality using commercial design processes at a commercial scale core. Um, the processor being used here, by the way, is the same one, roughly the same one being used in Amazon's AWS uh, for ARM-based CPUs. Uh, this is based on the N1 uh, SDB, uh, SDB uh, which is a reference board from ARM. Uh, the other adaptation we're doing is based on the open source RISC-V architecture. Uh, FreeBSD community users will know that uh, as part of our project, we perform with the initial port of FreeBSD to RISC-V in order to support this research. Um, so uh, a piece of sort of DARPA supported, uh, Cambridge and SRI supported contribution to FreeBSD that we're, we're very pleased with. We now use it extensively, so it's worked out for us. Um, hardware and software design. So on the RISC-V side, we have multiple FPGA-based cores that I mentioned before. And everything I described to you on software runs on all of these things. Uh, we also have the formal models and the compilers and so on. So uh, let's talk about these architectures. Our original research is on MIPS because in the 1990s, it was a 64-bit architecture that was RISC. Uh, by the late uh, 2010, uh, it was the only 64-bit RISC architecture that was still moderately commercially viable. On VAA had not been announced yet. Uh, by, by ARM, um, uh, you know, we use it with pipeline CPU designs, uh, doesn't really optimize to contemporary design goals, uh, among other things, very poor code density, lots of instructions to do relatively little, um, doesn't support efficient virtual memory, has a software managed TLB, various other things. I mean, completely fine, uh, worked great for our research, um, but not something that is really a commercial transition path at this point. Uh, on V8A, uh, incredibly mature, widely deployed, I would call it load store rather than risk because it's not as reduced as it could be, um, but it does keep certain fundamental design tenets from risk, um, such as not combining compute with load and store generally. Um, it is feature rich. Um, it makes some very different stylistic choices in the design of the instruction set. For example, you know, uh, MIPS, you can basically throw an architectural exception on almost any instruction, including add. Uh, in RMV8, they're, they're really careful to never throw exceptions except during instruction fetch or during memory access, basically. Um, and this makes designing superscalar out of order cores much better, basically. Um, they're much more resource limited in opcode space. They have a remarkable number of load store instruction variants. Uh, they have hardware pay to workers. They have contemporary virtual uh, machine features. They have an enormous software ecosystem, you know, Android and iOS and Windows and so on. Uh, and RISC-V, it is an open RISC ISA, uh, really you know, uh, existed as of a couple of years ago, has good good press, um, certainly an interest, you know, a vastly superior alternative to MIPS for the kind of work that we do, but I think also very promising in terms of you know, potential adoption. Um, live in the architectural complexity scale, I mean, somewhere between MIPS and RMV8A. Um, it is more like MIPS in the sense that it gets poor code density, 
Um, it's more like ARM and it has hardware page tables. Uh, a bunch of the features that we really need, like hypervisor support, are still maturing. I think they will become mature uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, the software stack is much less rich than Android. Uh, it was until a couple of years ago, much less mature than MIPS. But I think it's it's more than caught up with MIPS now from our perspective. So I think it's a nice, viable, open instruction set architecture. And it allows us to do open source processor designs, which is great. Uh, but I'll talk about ARM. Um, so we've been working since 2014. What have we been doing? Um, well, when we started Cherry, it was a MIPS thing. It was basically we started with MIPS and added protection stuff. So we had to reimagine Cherry, a supportable model, which could be across multiple architectures. And obviously, we've now succeeded in doing that. But the ARM work was what motivated it. Um, we had to solve a bunch of really hard problems. Uh, talking to ARM and their customers caused us to understand problems that as academics, we just never encountered before, um, associated with memory access patterns and energy use and all kinds of things, disturbance of the microarchitecture and super scalar behavior. Um, we published a bunch of papers, did some great research, and actually the results of that appear in Morella, which is nice. Um, we then had to show that the same abstraction that happened with the model in hardware could also happen in software. So you know, you have C as a portable language, and then you have the back ends of compilers that are clearly architecture specific. You have virtual memory where you know the Unix kernel has all kinds of VM APIs internally and externally that are portable, but uh, you know somewhere deep under the hood, something knows about your specific architecture. Uh, we've demonstrated the same thing as true of Cherry. Almost all of our code is portable, but you know there's a compiler backend and a bit of OS, you know, architecture code which is um, specific to the you know MIPS or RISC-V or ARM. Uh, but almost everything we do just works across all the architectures now uh, as a result of much suffering uh, on our part to try and to make the world a better place, I guess. Um, we had to run much bigger experiments with much larger application corpora, whole operating systems, not just you know selected programs. Um, we did a bunch of work on full modeling, which I won't talk about in this talk, but it actually is really exciting. This is, as I said, the first time anyone has ever done some of these things. Um, and then we had to solve just a ton of practical problems. But what were we doing? We were doing all this in order to demonstrate arguments for adoption. Uh, adoption is still, you know, it's not clear are we going to be successful. Um, what is clear is that we've moved on to the next stage of building really realistic, commercially viable processes so we can run the experiments we have to run to demonstrate that it is worth transitioning. So this is an important step. It is not the last step that ARM is shipping these chips by any measure, uh, but it also it's a really exciting step. So, uh, so what's going on? So the UK government funded something called Digital Security by Design. Um, UK RI, UK Research and Innovation. And they basically said, let's make a very large investment. Uh, the numbers here are in pounds. If you if you work in dollars, you should like a smidge higher in dollars, basically these days. It used to be more than a smidge, but then that didn't work out for the UK. Um, basically to really impose structure on a joint research project and then go off and build a very expensive piece of hardware. Um, and the argument for it was there's a supply chain gap. So if researchers you know, are quite concerned with this kind of thing. When you, you tell how I want to get um, something into production that's research. Well, we have to convince hardware people and software people. So convincing the hardware people is only possible if the software people are super excited. Convincing the software people is only possible if the hardware people basically have already built it and it's available in one to two years. And new work like this is five years away. You know, uh, it takes years to build the processes and do the architectural work, and et cetera. Um, so the goal of this prototype is to bridge the gap, is to provide a viable hardware platform that software people can try out and get excited about to show the ideas are a good idea in hardware, that they're worth it, basically, and that they do work. Um, so uh, it's going to support, and it is supporting, uh, the design of this chip. The design is actually almost done. Uh, it's going to go to tape out um, early next year sometime and then you know, become available late in the year. Um, they took an existing CPU design. Uh, the Neoverse N1 is a high-end ARM um, microarchitecture um, designed for server class behavior. Um, really, you know, very elegant. Uh, it's at the mature end of their processor designs right now. You know, as, as CPU designs age, they become more mature because just like software, they get patched and fixed as time goes by, which means most of the bugs are ours as opposed to being in the baseline ARM core, which was the important thing. And then there's a large scale collaboration around making these ideas useful, right? Uh, which of the things in Cherry which are really exciting, you know, which are the things that are essential. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that we're allowed to do science in the design of this chip. So we're allowed to produce more than one way of solving a problem in Cherry. So we can try them both out when the chip ships. Uh, and then later, if you if you productize, you say, okay, well, this was the better one. We'll, just, we'll stick with that, one, uh, which is quite neat. So we're looking at late 2021 right now. We think COVID is not going to substantially delay. Uh, it probably will affect, you know, affect slightly um, the hardware supply chains, but not enormously, we think. I'm going to show you two slides, uh, I think, which are from ARM themselves. So the first question is like, why does ARM care? Um, ARM is collaborating with us and investing really significantly. And the reason is that they spend a lot of time doing I mean, largely incremental patches to security, you know, adding uh, small hashes to pointers and um, you know, mitigating certain classes of vulnerabilities very carefully, adding a few new instructions here and there. 
Um, but despite the fact these things keep getting added, they keep being more exploits and more vulnerabilities. And one of the observations that's come out of Microsoft is that you know, over 70% of vulnerabilities year on year on year are memory safety vulnerabilities, despite you know, a decade of people working on static analysis and architectural mitigations and compiler improvements. So you know, we have the opportunity because our architectural mechanisms are stronger than non-probabilistic, for example, to really disrupt all that. Uh, we also have this new compartmentalization stuff, which is potentially really exciting, right? You can really do new things with software design. Um, and yet they're unvalidated ideas from at the scale of ARM. So the goal of this is basically to build a platform to allow ARM to run the experiments to convince their customers that this is a good idea. Um, one of the neat things ARM has agreed to do uh, is to actually not place IP constraints on anything that is important here. So we have very unusual agreement with ARM. I mean, Cambridge's perspective is we're giving this stuff away. The goal is to improve the world, basically. I mean, cybersecurity has a hard enough time if you don't have complicated patents associated with it. Uh, ARM has very kindly agreed to go along with that plan. Um, you know, obviously there will be ARM IP that is ARM specific, but the goal is to produce no obstacles to adoption in other architectures, whether it's open source RISC-V uh, or Intel x86. Self is what they call the real thing. Um, it's a bit unusual and it's a superset architecture. What does that mean? Normally ARM would strip out features uh, that are, you know, uh, duplicate functionality, right? Uh, they would pick the best one for a particular target and they would never put in two mechanisms for something. So the neat thing about Morello is that we're allowed to put in multiple mechanisms for something so that we can try them each out. Is that it affects performance. You know, um, you don't have as much time to optimize, but also the performance of, uh, in terms of critical paths is the performance of the slowest thing. So, you know, we are chosen to include more stuff um, than we would in a final version so that we can run these experiments, but still, it's going to run at multiple gigahertz. It's going to be a seven nanometer design. Uh, it's a high performance superscalar core. So that's really, really quite neat. Uh, will I tell you more about the board? Um, you know, um, it will have. It's a bit different than the server class design uh, in the reference design because they've also thrown in the GPU. Uh, one of the nice things about this project is it's helped to motivate uh, improvements in open sourcing of ARM GPU device drivers. So ARM's now collaborating on the Panfrost uh, related open source device drivers, uh, in part to support uh, Morello. So we want to have an open source device driver that works with this board. The obligatory system on chip picture, maybe we'll skim past that, but now you know there is one. That's the important thing. So let me spend the last couple of minutes just telling you about software. So. Um, we brought our entire Cherry software stack over to Morello because the goal is to validate Morello architecture. We have to show it's sufficient, that it's completely functional, then to evaluate the implementation, that it performs well, the energy use is acceptable. Um, it's also to provide a template for use. It's to show how you should use Cherry in a Morello software stack, right? You know, what should it look like? Um, and it's something that people can build demonstrations and prototypes on. Um, there are a bunch of consortium partners, uh, you know, something like nine UK universities have been funded to do research projects on it. We hope other organizations worldwide will do that. There'll be uh, some businesses announcing various kinds of exciting things uh, over the coming year or two as they try things out to build prototypes. To support future research, because I think, you know, it remains a research project. The goal is to kind of shift gears, though. What we want is a bunch of research projects that are working on software based on Cherry, right? I mean, Cherry surely can be improved, but what we need to understand now is how to use it best. So we have a, a DARPA sponsored software stack. It may look familiar to you if you're the kind of person who watches this kind of video. Uh, it is all open source all the time. Uh, we find the Cherry Clang LLVM compiler suite coming out of SRI in Cambridge, adapted to Morello by Arm and Lenaro. Uh, we will have an open source uh, hypervisor. Um, this doesn't exist on our RISC-V platform because of the lack of suitable hypervisor extensions. Uh, we have a FreeBSD-based software stack uh, supported by DARPA. Uh, we have an Android-based stack developed by Arm. Uh, on the FreeBSD side, uh, we have all the rich protection features that we have been developing for the last decade. Uh, it's actually you know, quite a mature operating system at this point. Uh, we've had external consumers using it in various research projects for, for several years now. Um, and you know, it's hand wave. Uh, the kernel, uh, for example, is spatially memory safe. Uh, buffer overflows cause hardware traps and so on. Uh, you can't inject pointers into the kernel for, uh, via the network or from user space. Uh, all kinds of neat properties. Uh, we'll have these uh, forms of compartmentalization available directly in the FreeBSD implementation. Uh, on top of that, um, we have a pretty rich open source software ecosystem. It will start out small and then it will get larger. We'll be able to run um, existing ARMv8 ARC64 binaries fine, but the goal, of course, is actually to have them use the Cherry features. Uh, and so that corpus will gradually grow. Um, you know, you could do crazy clean slate operating systems that use Cherry for all kinds of neat things. We have a couple of projects like that, but the focus for Morello is actually less the crazy stuff and more the transitionable, viable, incremental stuff. Uh, I should mention that we do have some of these projects, maybe another talk, we'll get to talk about that. 
So what does it look like? Um, so Cherry BSD, uh, the first release, is going to take place this month uh, alongside the executable model from ARM. You'll be able to download instruction set simulator from ARM uh, towards the end of October. Maybe things go badly the beginning of November. Uh, and the same day, you'll be able to download a FreeBSD image that boots up and runs uh, all of FreeBSD user space and perhaps some third-party applications with some really neat security properties. Um, in December, uh, we'll do a software update uh, that provides a memory-safe kernel uh, in the October version. Uh, user space can be memory safe, but the kernel itself is sort of more conventional um, uh, kernel. And then going out over the next year, every quarter, uh, we're going to release new features out, and then we're going to maintain the thing for about three years afterwards, uh, providing software updates and uh, you know supporting the community in various ways. We'll be sure to ship security patches, uh, for example, where we we encounter issues. So, uh, so to wrap up, and then maybe take some questions. Um, and I think it's important people understand that Morello is not a production architecture. You can't go build a product on it immediately. The goal of this architecture and this work is to allow you to decide whether Cherry is something that the world should do. So if you are an individual or a large company doing something exciting and security is important to you, you know, you should go take a look at Morello and you should figure out, does this solve the kind of problems that you have? Could you use this to do new and interesting things you could never do before? You know, once you've decided that, then there's a bigger conversation to have as a community. You know, um, you know, in the ARM world, is it you know, are there enough customers to justify going off and doing the work to continue to take this to production? You no, know, I think we hope certainly hope so. But if there were, then I guess we would be doing that right now rather than building Morello. On the other hand, Morello is real enough that we can answer all these questions. Um, but I think there's also a lot of hard questions about how to use these features. Um, you know, the immediate question many people ask is, well, you know, I have all these type safe, memory safe, managed languages. What about them? And the answer is, we you know. Uh, not least, they're often their language runtimes are written in C and C plus plus. So we want to use Cherry for that. But actually, there are a lot of other opportunities too to do interesting things there. To wrap up. Uh, what is Cherry? It is this new uh, set of architectural security primitives that required really rich evaluation in hardware and software. It took us a long time to do this research, and it's still ongoing. Right. Uh, but something exciting is happening. Uh, we get all of these exciting security properties. We get real software code bases. Uh, we get interesting formally proven security properties. And we get a transition path to a real world ARM processor um, that is shipping next November. So I'll point you at our website, uh, cherrycpu.org. I'll point you at our technical reports. Some of them are more bedtime reading than exciting daytime reading, but you know, do what you can. Uh, and then I'm happy to take questions uh, that people may have. So I will quit from my presentation package and stop sharing and see how we're doing. So oh, I haven't seen any questions come in. Um, I think you covered so much that it's so much information for all of us to digest. I'm wondering um, if we need people <laughs> to sit back and um, think through this. And, um, and what I wanted to say was that I, people are welcome to post questions here later. and. Um, and we can share them with Robert and answer them. Um, I think the, the easiest way for us to, to share them is, is over Twitter. Um, and so you're also uh, welcome to post or to tweet and tag the foundation there too and um, and get Robert to answer there. So sure, happy that. I mean, you know, as I said, a decade of research, a new computer architecture and fundamental changes to software. If it required some digesting, no one would be surprised. And that was like 50, <laughs> three minutes worth of that. So we will be understanding. I mean, I have to say, I am totally honored to have had the opportunity to sit here and listen to you live, give this, uh, you know, I'll refer to it as a lecture because that reminds me of a college lecture and you're a professor. And so you presented it a little bit that way, but you did it in a way, especially at the beginning that really helped um, people like me understand, uh, you know, you're in simple terms like capability, because I've actually struggled with that. You know, I knew it was part of um, Cherry, yeah, but what does it really mean? And so you started with that, and then you went into explaining Cherry and uh, and then Cherry BSD and why you chose FreeBSD. And so um, to be able to go back to this, uh, we've, you know, we've recorded this and we'll post it soon. And to be able to either rewatch and to, um, especially, I know for me, I'm gonna rewatch it before I give, I'm giving a free BSD presentation uh, or recording one later today. And um, and I was gonna talk about Cherry. And so it really gave me that basic understanding. Cause I, you know, once you understand the foundations of things, it really helps you 
grasp, you know, the more. Yeah, I mean, our experience, you know, I mean, I said we have we have a sizable team, and you know, we are in a university world, so PhD students come and go, and people are joining us and leaving us all the time. Um, Our experience is to really get started with Cherry at a high level of expertise. You know, there's at least a three to six month ramp up. It's not that you're not productive on the first day, but you know, deep work on the system, you know, to use it in exciting ways, then it takes months to really get up to speed. And also like ideally synchronous communication with a person next to you on Slack or something to try and answer questions. Um, we recently had a chance to do this red teaming exercise called FET uh, with DARPA in which DARPA uh, crowdsourced a lot of using bug bounties, a uh, whole bunch of, uh, you know, professional ethical hackers and penetration testers to come try all this stuff out. It was really neat. But, you know, it was a three month exercise and we found that we got engagement we got very good engagement in the end, actually, but we found we got that engagement only once we produced a lot of training and teaching material and had, you know, supported people coming online and getting used to the platform. Um, I mean, the nice thing as a freebie to use it, though, is you don't have to understand all this stuff for it to protect you, right? I mean, the experience with Morello, we hope, is going to be the day the board ships, you download your FreeBSD image on the USB store, whatever, you know, you stick it on there. Um, up with FreeBSD, and it looks like FreeBSD has always looked, right? You log in at the login prompt, you install your packages, you run your web browser, and yet you're in a vastly better world. You're in a world where, you know, 70% plus of the vulnerabilities that used to affect you have just disappeared. Uh, and of the remaining 30%, you know, maybe we also have a significant impact on some of those. Um, and that's really is a, that's a big change, especially if it can be transparent. And, you know, the big experiment, as I said, from Morello is, um, is it fast enough, right? You know, is the performance good enough? Is the energy use low enough? Because that's the thing that gets you from the stage where we've demonstrated, in some sense, the richness of these ideas and the maturity of the ideas, and you could stick it in every phone and every server. So we will find out, I guess, in a year's time, just how well that works. But I hope that um, you know, in the open source community, there's going to be limited access to these boards. So I guess the first thing I would encourage people to do, if you want to play with this stuff, um, you know, try out the emulators. Uh, we are actually currently looking at doing a QMU implementation. Obviously, it won't have the snazzy performance properties and the multi-core, you know, etc. But it'll run all the same software. Um, but you know, if you work for a company though that builds ARM-based products, it is worth talking to your system on chip vendor, uh, talking to ARM. If you go to the ARM partner meeting, you know, obviously there's a limited community of people who do these things, but you know, if you go to those events, talk to them about Morella, talk to them about Cherry. Can you get access to one of these boards and try it out? Um, our objective is to make several boards available to the FreeBSD Foundation and FreeBSD project to use uh, in trying to understand the platform better. Um, and we'll see how all of that plays out. Um, you know. FreeBSD is is really unique. We couldn't have done this research without FreeBSD because it is this tightly integrated operating system. It is well engineered. Um, it turns out stylistically, the C code is written in a way that's really conducive to memory protection. That is not true of all source code we look at. You know, sometimes you go to an application, you discover it is a nightmare to make it work on Cherry because it's so full of bugs, and we find the bugs. Um, so FreeBSD is really great to use there. Um, so FreeBSD users and companies that use FreeBSD have a real advantage because they can start you know start running where the rest of the world is going to start crawling. Uh, and adopting these kinds of features, which is quite neat. Well, this has been really cool getting a window into uh, the world of research. Uh, I think you're the first talk that we had. And so I think that this is, has got to be really interesting to the FreeBSD community and new people who are just getting exposed to FreeBSD. So thank you so much for this. You're very welcome. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. And as you know, as you said, if there are questions that turn up later, I'm, I'm happy to, to send out answers. And people get in touch with me personally uh, by email, whatever, and you know, happy to, to chat. OK. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, so I do, um, I'm not trying to promote, or you know, we, I, I don't get any royalties or commissions from promoting uh, Robert's book, but he is the co-author of this. Hopefully, you can see it again. And I really recommend it for um, really delving into um, operating system design. I've read a few of these chapters, and it's uh, it goes into a lot of detail. And um, yeah, well, well, I I do get royalties, and I absolutely encourage right. you to buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's help Robert out. Um, but anyway, uh, so I want to introduce our uh, our next or not introduce, but tell you about our next talk. It'll be in two weeks, uh, which is October twenty third. Uh, we don't have a time set yet because the talk will be coming from Australia and it will be an introduction to Beehive from uh, Peter Graham and he is one of the um, uh, he's um, he's one of the original uh, developers on Beehive. Um, so anyway, so thank you and we'll see you in two weeks.